My name is Omar. I'm from NVIDIA. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, something that I've been working on for the past three and a half years. Um, the title of my talk is This Machine Has No Brain, Can It Borrow Yours? Um, does anyone have any idea what this is in reference to? Has anyone seen these signs before, IRL? This is actually from Fallout, but um, these, these signs are whenever, whenever you have a machine um, that can kill you, uh, th this sign usually um, is in some form next to it. Um, and I'm here to give a warning to everyone because we're uh, facing a crisis we don't yet see. Uh, in about 10 years from now, um, we're going to have robots everywhere. Um, so we already have some form of robots in our personal space, right? Uh, we've had, um, for example, cleaning robots hang out for the past 10 years. Um, but now we, uh, you know, we're, we're beginning to see some changes in the effect and the amount of robots that we have in our personal lives or doing logistics for us. And that's mostly because uh, we have amazing reach nowadays, right? We have um, innovations in motors and um, in, uh, in microcontrollers that can do st stabilization. We also have innovation in dexterity. So uh, grippers that, that uh, used to be something that was very specialized are now, uh, we can now manufacture them uh, pretty much in mass manufacturing, even for like the most uh, specialized tasks. So you would have um, rubber uh, and silicone in uh, injection molding, which is uh, a mass manufacturing technique, but now it's very common in robotics. So you can do so soft robot robots, but you can also have um, uh, robots with tendons um, that have a very high gear ratio. So over here, you're, you're looking at, um, a robot from the Cornell Organic Robotics Laboratory uh, that's holding a can, right? So uh, it's very accurate uh, for a machine to be holding a can without crushing it. Um, and this is done pretty much with custom motors. So this is, you know, like we're definitely going in the direction of precise machinery. And we also have AI, um, as you well know, and the infrastructure is also going uh, pretty much to personal ro personalized robots. We have data centers at the edge, which means uh, you might have a data center in your uh, next year traffic light or just by the base station of your mobile phone. So the economy is pretty much not going to allow it to be anything else. We are headed towards a completely autonomous future in several fields. And this is a problem. This is a really big problem because what's missing in this chart is that we don't have good design for any of these robots. So no one's designing their behavior. And if they're gonna be interacting with the elderly in healthcare, with food preparation, with delivery and logistics, they all need to be designed to work around, to work around humans. And so far, it's a hack, right? We don't have a stack to actually use robots interacting with humans, and we need to think about how we're doing it. And my proposal over here is that simulation is the right way of doing this. Um, so let's start with a basic question. I know you all work in VR, but how many people here know these images? Okay. These were the world's first ray traced images. They were created in 1979 uh, by Turner Witted. It would, that was a paper that he released while he was at Bell Labs. Um, he called these uh, very imaginatively figured six, seven, and eight. <laughs> Um, they were part of a, of a paper where he's describing also how ray tracing works, which he described in figure one, figures one and two. Um, one is a description of the actual algorithm, the other is a description of um, Snell's law, which is a way to um, describe how light moves through uh, different media. Um, we haven't gone to simulate actual optics and therefore have so sort of like photorealistic re rendering until very recently, right? Um, if you look quickly at the evolution of computer graphics, we, you know, had our first um, popular 3D engine that can run in real time in 1993. Uh, on the other hand, we had our first ray traced film in 2006. Uh, well, if you ask the people at Pixar, they would say that a lot of the ray tracing there that I would consider fully ray traced was a hack. I consider it fully ray traced. They actually managed to simulate a whole model of light. Um, but something happened along the, the, the way. We have this now, right? 
Um, and with, uh, with GPUs, we can suddenly do things like create game engines with which approach uh, photorealistic simulation. Um, in this case, we're looking at uh, Buenos Kite demo by Epic Games, which did a lot of photogrammetry around the environment. But nowadays, when we've reached um, real-time ray tracing in GPUs, we can move between what is basically this all the time um, to this, right? I'm going to do that again because I love that. <laughs> Apologies to everyone. Um, yeah, but what, what this actually means is that suddenly, like, we have, we, we've achieved several levels of abstraction throughout the years, right? We started out by being able to only make games via basically assembly language and then slowly evolved into what we have now in game engines, right? Like Unity and Unreal. Um, but the same thing happened in graphics in general, right? If you worked in a film in the 1980s and 1990s, you'd be doing everything with command line interfaces. Now we're using Photoshop and Maya and Nuke. And this also happened in robotics because um, when you were working, you're working on robotics in the 1970s, you were building all of your own circuitry. Uh, around the 1990s, you started having microcontrollers that were very expensive and hard to program. And nowadays, the stack is almost completely solved for you. You have operating systems like ROS that do all of the all of the robotic control um, on one hand. On the other hand, you have very good hardware. You have GPUs on the robots themselves. Some companies make them. I'm not going to name names. <laughs> and um, the underlying idea behind all of this is that from engineering, from well, a culture that is supposed to build machines for other people to, to have ideas on top of, we now have design frameworks. And from the idea of modeling a, well, making a mathematical model to, uh, to solve a problem, we're now just teaching computers to do this, right? So in a way, you can talk about machine learning being the abstraction um, to how you design human-robot interaction. So I want to talk about machine learning a little bit so we're all on the same page. Um, I think this is the, the first interesting component of, um, of deep learning um, that was ever introduced. This is, this is, I think this is the first paper um, from Stanford in the 50s about neural networks. Uh, at the time, they, they could deal with one, um, basically one solver which had a bunch of inputs and would output a sort of like a linear result, is this above a plane, is this below a plane? As a result, we slowly evolved into these, right? So you can have multiple um, layers of, of many input nodes. And um, because of GPUs, we can we evolved to this. This is Google Net from 2006. Um, no, from 2016, I'm sorry. 2006, what happened to me? Um, all of these contain subnetworks, which contains the perceptrons from the previous slide. This is a very, very big network. The problem with these is that there is an underlying thing that fuels all of them. It's data, right? And we have evolved to needing data everywhere. So if you are building any kind of system which, has, which takes um, resources from the real world and makes a conclusion about something new, it is using some form of data. And there's a market for data as a result because uh, everything that used to be modeled is now learnable and learnable with data that doesn't necessarily belong to the company that made it. And if you're using so social media, you are also part of that market, right? You, you are b being used as a example in learning. This is, a, this is a photo from my house just before I left here. I, I, I just got a new sofa last week, so I just removed the old sofa. And you don't have a sofa in this photo. Um, this is from a camera that uh, is connected to the internet, and it helps me know if someone's at home. Um, but along with powering this camera, I signed uh, a, a user, like a, a EULA, um, end user license agreement uh, that forces me to give up all of the data from that camera and help the company that makes the camera uh, train its algorithm, its models on um, whatever it wants, actually. So it can sell my data to other companies. Uh, it won't release the raw data, but it can use it for training, right? I, I'm, I'm not 
I'm not extremely happy with this. Um, but the, the reality is if you buy a camera attached headset or if you buy a camera attached car, which you are doing, um, they'll have the same kind of end user's license agreement. Like your data won't belong to you and your data will be used to train newer models for uh, the future of robotics. There are multiple problems with it, but I think the biggest problem that everyone is ignoring is that no amount of data is enough. When we look at data that's coming from users, we're looking at the normal behavior most of the time. It's very hard to, to catch anomalies. Anomalies don't appear in the, in the data set, or when they do appear, they appear very sparsely, right? So if you're trying to train a self-driving car, you need to train it for stuff like this. That's not an image that you would typically see driving down the street unless you live in New York like I do. Um, this is a very hard image for a neural network running inside a self-driving car to parse. It has multiple lights. It doesn't know where the sources are. This is a rare occurrence. Like I would call this an anomaly. But anomalies exist everywhere in the data, right? You're not training for this. You're certainly not training for this, right? So some data sets don't exist right now, but some data sets also can't exist. It's going to be very hard or unethical to get the data sets in advance for machines to actually use when you're, um, when you're building a product that requires um, a mathematical model running behind the scenes. <sighs> so I have a solution. This image isn't real. Um, it's part of our, uh, it's part of our uh, simulator for self-driving cars that called DriveSim. Um, we, we've been using this for quite a bit at NVIDIA. Uh, the, pre the premise of synthetic data seems reasonable. There's no data in the real world, you just have to make it, right? And there's two things to attack here. One is generating imagery, enough imagery for ground truth to provide data for, um, for the networks to learn if you were in a scenario where you have a lot of red lights or if you're in a scenario which has complexity in the road. Um, but the other one is generating interesting scenarios. Creating images like this one um, pretty much at random solves for one. It solves for the ground truth. It doesn't really solve for a scenario. So we have to think about how, how to create scenarios for robots to learn how to behave um, when it comes to things that are hard to capture in the real world. This is one example of, the, of something we've been doing. This is a bunch of robots together in our, in our product called Isaac. These are all simulated. And they're learning how to um, how to play hockey, right? So um, all of them just have a stick, and they all they know how to do is just move the stick. And they also have a score function, um, which tracks the puck and tells um, tells them how close they are to the goal. After enough iterations, those robots learn that they get a better score if they move the stick such that it hits the puck, and they move the stick such that it hits the puck on the way to the goal. And when they do, they get a super high score so that then they know how to repeat that again. And they get all the observation from the real world um, and just use that to make that one specific uh, action. Now, if you think that's strange, um, you need to get used to it because that's of how all of robotics works right now. And that's the most intelligence robot will be for a while, <laughs> unfortunately. What are we actually doing here? That hockey thing that I showed you, that's the environment, right? Your environment as a robot playing hockey is a field. There's a goal in there. There's a puck somewhere. You see all of that. And you, as an agent, are looking at the environment. You're making an observation. After you've made an observation, time to make some action, right? So you'd be moving the puck. And it doesn't happen just once. It happens at very, very high uh, frequencies, right? So you'd be moving the puck a little bit. And then you've, you're observing the world again. It's my... Sorry, not the puck, the stick. Uh, is my stick too fast? Is my stick too slow? Until you've reached a good speed and you've reached a good direction, it's time to hit the puck and you've hit the puck and stopped. And if you got something good out of it, well, what happens actually? There's something missing here, right? Someone has to tell you that you've, gotten, that you've done something good. So there's also an interpreter in the process. And if you've done something good, they'll give you a reward. So this is a 
the basic idea behind reinforcement learning. And if you um, look at any kind of reinforcement learning um, paper, you'll see that there's always some you know, system on top of this, but this is the basic idea. There's an, there's an agent in the world, they make an action, and, um, and they, they get a reward as a result. Now, I want to ask you, how many parts of these, syst of these systems can we debug right now? <laughs> so um, if you would be um, a reinforcement learning uh, expert, what you'd be debugging is the interpreter. Um, you'd be looking at uh, what the robot actually gets rewards back from, and you'd be tweaking that reward function, right? Get closer to the goal, cool. Maybe, maybe getting closer to the goal isn't enough. Maybe you need to hit it at high, sp high speeds. So you tweak the function a little bit so that the stick uh, that's actually moving, um, you get a higher reward if you hit the goal and it's a high speed, right? You could be, for example, saying, as long as you got close to the goal, that's already high score, so do that. Um, so there's a lot to tweak there to debug something. Um, and that goes into the agent. But there's something really big that you're not debugging that way, and that's the environment, right? So a lot of things happening with the robot when they're interacting with the actual world, you can't solve because you can't change the environment too much. You don't have a debugger for that. So we made a debugger for that. This is the first example of a VR experience that, um, that I created. Um, this is for SIGGRAPH 2017. Um, what's happening here is you're playing dominoes with a fellow called Isaac. This is Isaac. Um, he has dominoes, I have dominoes. I'm gonna pick up a domino from my side and I am going to place that piece of domino on the table in front of him. So as I do this, I pick this up. This is done with a, with the UE4. It's already two and a half years old. So it's been a while. Um, so I'll place this piece of domino. It's got a four and a five. And now I'm going to hit the button. In Isaac's neural networks, what's happening is that he needs to evaluate, they need to evaluate um, the type of domino. They need to evaluate what the legal move is. And then they need to act on it. And in this case, Isaac connected a, f a five and a five. So it's a legal move. Great. And it, it's, it was almost geometrically legal as well. So good on him. Uh, now, I put a six and a six together, so he has a few more options on his board. Um, so he's going to look at it again and perform the same action. This time he's taking a, what is that? Taking a four and connecting a four to a four. Okay, so what's going on here is that this is a very controlled environment in which we can check or we can intervene with the environment for the robot to play in, right? And I want to talk a little bit about how we did that. So the first thing to do is to train the vision network for the robot. We generated a lot of uh, images of dominoes. So this is also done in Unreal Engine. We pretty much simply threw a bunch of dominoes in the space and we attached to each image as we outputted them uh, the ground truth, right? What is this domino? And the, the neural network can then learn um, what, uh, what number and, and where is the domino. And it, we also added a bunch of distractors. So, um, the uh, the neural network wouldn't pick up on everything being a domino. Now you notice that these images are not photorealistic. And this is another very important point. We don't know, we actually don't know um, what, what neural networks consider important, right? This is a research topic. Um, so we started from the very basic things and we slowly improve upon them. The next step after we trained the vision network was to just take a very, very simple agent and to play a lot of games with the robot. We played about something like 50,000 games um, until the robot's reinforcement learning network learned how to make the right moves. And then we debugged it in VR. So at every step that we thought that the robot was good enough, we would we'd play a few games in, in VR. And now we wanted to do something else. Actually, at any point in this process, did we assume that the robot was virtual? We didn't, right? So if this can work on a virtual robot, it may as well work on a real robot that has the grippers and the right uh, physical configuration, right? Do you think it's going to work? Yeah, it works. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is a robot that we actually deployed in uh, SIGGRAPH 2017. Um, it literally is running the same networks. When we first put it up, um, nothing worked. 
And I was really upset. And I then realized I put the camera 90 degrees off, so I rotated the camera, and suddenly everything worked. Because the robot just had the same vision network and it had the same gameplay network, so it could just play the game. The only thing that was different about it was that, in this case, uh, we were not using the same inverse kinematics as in the, um, the uh, control system that powers the, the grippers. Um, but everything else was just the same. So there is no difference when you're actually getting it right between a physical robot and a virtual robot. And this is a very important takeaway here, right? So um, here are the goals that we set up when we, when we started this. We have to use VR interactively with machine learning. Um, most of the team that we had weren't roboticists. At the time, I was not a roboticist. Um, we can't use end-to-end -end training. We have to modularize the entire system. Um, and we have to do it really fast. In fact, we, we had two weeks to do that. Um, so building the system was a challenge just, just from a time crunch perspective. The way to solve it is we used the best component for each layer, right? We started with a, um, just the, uh, the image recognition system for, for dominoes. Um, completely separately from that, after we assumed this works, we had separately trained um, a reinforcement learning uh, network on the gameplay. And completely separately from that, we were testing a physical uh, control layer or a virtual control layer for the robot, right? So at the very end of the process, we were testing both VR and um, a real robot at the same time. The reasoning for this is that we can debug the virtual robot really quick. And the physical robot is a little slower, otherwise it will kill you, pretty much. Um, so, here are the tech stats on this, just so, so you want to know that the production itself was two and a half weeks. Uh, we had separate teams uh, doing each part of the, um, of the process. There was the vision, the policy. Policy is, is how the gameplay is played. Uh, the physical robot, the HRI, and the art. I led the, um, the HRI and the art and the, virtual, and the VR. Um, and um, we trained a vision network with uh, 30,000 domino images with uh, our, own, um, our own simulator called Isaac Data Studio. Um, the policy network used, I'm sorry, I thought it was 50,000, it's 80,000 uh, games to get the robot to the right position. I tested it after about 50,000 games. Um, it wasn't good enough. Uh, we also had to redo some of the components. At the time, this is about um, two and a half years ago, at the time, um, the training was quite, quite slow, as in, like, it took 24 hours to play uh, 80,000 games, um, which, when you're in a time crunch, actually matters. So testing it early, uh, virtually, really mattered to us. Um, and the components were never integrated until deployment, right? The other thing that's really important to say here is that all the teams were separate. I was in my home office in New York. Um, some of the uh, uh, AI people were in Toronto and um, some people were in Austin and the physical robot was LA, I think, I'm not sure. Um, so, so we were all completely separate and we could get it, and we could get it done, right? Um, I'm gonna skip this. So uh, the other takeaways here is that we built this in such a way that people know what to expect when they're testing the robot, right? This is not a smart machine so far. One day we'll be at a point where this is a smart machine, but so far, it's kind of like a five-year-old child learning how to play dominoes, so you have to be patient, right? So by putting this inside the story, people wouldn't make smart moves at first. We can actually debug using the simple cases. Um, if you're in VR, you get bored, right? Uh, but if you're in VR thinking you're playing against a five-year-old child, you get bored less quickly because you're thinking, what's going on in their head, right? Is this, is this a good move? Is that a bad move? Um, so that's really important to keep in mind when designing things like this. Um, the other thing that, that's, that we realized is really important is that players don't remember um, if you tell them, oh, just, just don't put like... Um, just don't put one of those tiles uh, sideways because that's, that's a move, that's an advanced move but they will remain, remember game mechanics really well. So, you know, we've been game, playing games all of our lives, so we, we get to know what, um, you know, a, a game of dominoes looks like, and we kind of listen to that, or we tune into that. Um, we don't really tune into instructions like, oh, no, no, just don't touch that, right? But if you make something in the game that makes you not touch that, 
really helps in the simulation. Um, obviously, I talked about it. When you modularized all components, we could really speed up because we weren't dependent on each other at any point. I could generate fake data in the first week um, and have everyone test with the fake data. And then I could bring in real data and replace the fake data. And it just worked, right? And the other thing we realized as we were doing this, what we were actually building is a debugger, right? So we need the ability to cache previous games. And we need the ability to switch between an, a later version of the framework to an earlier version and test which one is better, right? Do A-B testing on that. So using this knowledge, you can actually go very far. Um, you can train very advanced networks to do things like self-driving cars. These aren't real images, again. What this is, is um, output from a neural network looking at synthetic data that we have inside DriveSim, our self-driving car simulator. I want to talk about it a little bit, just so you know what we're actually building when we're building uh, gameplay environments for robots. So. In this case, we have um, this car model. It has a bunch of cameras. All these cameras uh, need to inform the car on how to make decisions in a, an autonomous driving situation, right? So uh, cars would be driving around and they get some anomalies, right? Um, so we need to emulate all the sensors in the car and we need to recreate dan dangerous and rare scenarios to do that. Um, and so we can manually inject inside the environment. We can inject fog, snow, um, rain. We can make some, some arbitrary tra traffic congestions. Uh, we can add really backlit scenes with fog. Um, so, so the sensors barely do anything, but they can still react properly because we train them on many extreme cases. And we get this and we also apply some distributed computing to this because we don't have to train one scenario. We can train a bunch of scenarios at the same time and kill the, the ones that we don't like, right? The ones that we don't like didn't perform well in like a rainy street. Um, okay, redo that, right? We'll, 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 we'll use another. Um, and this, this approach should work, right? Do you think it works? Yeah, it works. Um, so this is a test that we have from um, about a year ago? Yeah, it's about a year ago. Uh, we, did the, we did a test with um, one of our autonomous vehicles. Uh, this one is in, uh, in the South Bay. Uh, we're running a track of like 80 miles. Um, and this is real data that you see here. So, so what's, what's actually happening is the car's driving around and it's picking up on all the road marks and so on. In order to validate this information, what we're doing is we're recreating the same track Virtually, so you see on the left here, you see DriveSim. DriveSim is our self-driving car simulator, and it's using all the information um, to recreate that ride and validate it to see that we can inject more dangerous scenarios. In that case, maybe the car wouldn't make it. So we want to validate all of these. We add this layer to it, right? We're just changing the environment, and we're not telling a real environment from a virtual environment as far as the, uh, the evaluation network is concerned because they're not different. So the layers that we have here are simulation on one hand, emulation on se of sensors on the other hand, and at the bottom we also have imitation. We're adding more data for the, the, the machines to be able to use without exactly understanding what a human is doing or what um, you know, other players in the, dr the driving simulator are doing, but still be able to do something with it, right? Like if you, if you don't know why a machine has done a certain thing, but you're still able to navigate around that, well, mission accomplished pretty much the same way. Um, this is one example of what I mean. So this is a, a demo by a colleague of mine named Madeline Gannon. She built uh, this playful robot. Now this is, a, this is an assembly robot from ABB Robotics. This thing can definitely uh, kill you. Um, it's very big and it's very powerful. And if you get too close to it, um, just one wrong move can break a few bones. Um, but in this scenario, she made it look cute and inquisitive, right? Mimicking humans in a way. And this, uh, so this, this field has grown quite a bit in recent years. This is um, a work by Daniel Holden from about a year and a half ago or two years ago. Uh, he uh, made a neural network that 
uh, combines a bunch of different motion captured uh, humans uh, to recreate motion. And over here, what you see is that this, this character is getting a bunch of terrains that it hasn't seen before and still reacting properly because a neural network is mixing all of the different um, terrains that, that uh, were available in training time. It's just doing it intelligently. So the thing looks like it's acting, re reacting pretty normally. The same university also released about a year ago um, pretty much the same type of network with some modifications, but done on a wolf, right? Um, there's some improvement there. Also, you see that the motion is very, very natural. Please don't ask me how they motion captured a wolf. Um, we have been doing the same sort of things only with reinforcement learning. So uh, over here you have um, Isaac Jim, it's our own uh, training system just for reinforcement learning where we're training uh, virtual characters to just get up and um, tap each other. Um, there's, there's definitely a video game in here somewhere. Um, there's no mocap here, just physics. And um, we can do this with imitation, right? So one character here, the, uh, the, the, the physics simulation that you see on the left, it has all the characteristics of a human body. So it has the biomechanical model of a human body, and it's observing another motion-captured clip, and it's trying to imitate it. So what we're doing is we're providing real world data, real human data into the process. And then another machine is just imitating that and it's getting a good score for doing it right, right? And it's not actually using the motion capture data. It's learning to activate its own actuators and motors to move like the motion captured human. And it's getting a result, it's getting a score on the end result, not on the joints, right? Is that clear? Cool. And we can make mass games with it. So in this case, we motion captured a bunch of um, a bunch of different positions, and we also inserted some some synthetic data into it. In this case, they're trying um, to do backflips. Over here, they're trying to do some mass games, and you see how this is this evolves into the training of a character in a video game. So uh, next time you kill a monster in Doom, I want you to feel a little guilty. Um, it's done so much for you. Okay. So um, so now we can create imitation based data sets, and we can actually do useful things with them. So this is one uh, other VR experiences that I created in which you're using the same robot that you had before, but now you're making pretzels. So in this case, um, the user gets, uh, gets uh, the chef's hat, and they get to transform themselves into the robot and control its uh, actuators, control its grippers, and, the, and they'd be folding a pretzel. So they're grabbing, they're grabbing a, a pretzel from both ends. This is sticky dough. Uh, it's, it's also soft, so you have to shake it off your hands. Um, you'll notice here something strange. The robot doesn't have the same joint structure as we do. So we need to think about what it looks like when we make a motion. And sometimes we're wrong, and that's when you see this, this thing turning red, like this virtual gripper turning red. There's the real world, which is the, that virtual gripper, and then there's the virtual world, which, which is where you see the robot. That was a legal move. So this uh, simulator is only tra is only made to make legal moves inside um, inside the VR experience, and whenever I whenever my hand is green, I can do this. Now I ring the bell when I'm done, and now you have the robot imitating my exact motion. So after I've, I've recorded it, the robot is going to try again, and they're going to fold the dough, which is fully simulated here, the same way that I had just done. So this is training a virtual robot to do a completely manual human task. And now that it's done, uh, I have my little helper robot do a salt bay move here. I'm, this is, mind you, this is a year and a half ago. I, I was very proud of it at the time. Um, so now it's going to bake the pretzel. Everyone's happy. Um, I think this is uh, a very significant process in um, that's... It's going to be part of the, uh, of the future of labor in many ways. We're going to train robots to do this small action that we are so good at doing, but hate doing, right? It's going to happen over and over again. So I want you to notice a few things that, I, that we found along the process that might be interesting. So one is it is totally non-trivial the way you choose um, to control the robot. We control the robot from first person because it, we thought it was interesting enough to make it such that... Um, you would learn how the robot, um, how the robot can move from the perspective of a human, right? Some some moves are legal, 
Um, but the other options that we tried are grabbing things by the object. So instead of grabbing the actual gripper, I could grab some virtual point away from the gripper where the actual object, the endpoint should be and have the robot attempt to grip it. That had limitations. We also tried standing at a distance from the robot so we can see what's going on and complete the task from our perspective because there's nothing actually limiting the robot from doing the entire task upside down, like mirrored. Um, we just happen to be piloting the robot from, from first person. We could be piloting the robot from third person and it would be completing the, robot, the, the same task from our perspective. So there's no difference really. We try that too. At this point you see this kind of like preview where there's a bit of a rope between you and the robot doing that. Um, we also tried following the actual gripper uh, with a controller. Um, that turned out to be weird. It has definitely has some advantages, but you still run into the same problems of legal moves as you had before from the first person perspective, only it's harder to track. And we also tried doing that at a distance, right? Um, I think the main conclusion out of that is just don't, don't make controls that are special for the game because you'll end up making them anyway. And as a result, um, of thinking that way, we ended up making the actual controls that we needed. So we had uh, visible motion bounds for anywhere that the robot couldn't reach. We also had the legal state indicator to see when the inverse kinematic system that solves for where the robot should be actually doesn't hit a singularity or doesn't hit a motion bound. Um, we also placed all of our scenarios inside the environment so people can get used to doing the action inside where they should be. But that wasn't enough because actually folding a pretzel itself, that task requires some training. And so when people started doing it, we, we thought this would be enough to train them, right? By just showing them a how-to somewhere in the game, but it wasn't enough. So when we actually set this up, we had a, a rope on the table so people can train on the real material. And this really matters because what, when you, what you're actually doing when you're inside a simulation is you're trying to use all your proprioception, your natural senses of where, where the world might be and um, you end up relying on some defaults that suck. Um, so by having uh, good intuition to what, what you're doing, this is helpful. Um, the other thing that's super important uh, when building a robotic simulation is to make sure you understand the difference between you and the robot. In this case, we had a robot that couldn't cross um, its arms. Right? So this motion was illegal. Whenever I was, would fold a pretzel like this, the simulation would fail, right? And the arm would actually stop somewhere here because there was a motion bound. Um, however, the robot is more robust than us in other cases. For example, there's no limitation that the robot could fold the pretzel when it's facing outside. Um, so make sure you understand what the limitations of the robot are and make sure that you understand how fast the system can evaluate alternative cases. In this case, the reinforcement learning system can search in a very limited space very quickly, but as soon as you move outside that space, it's actually not intuitive. So doing things like going above a, a hand is not something that a robot can intuitively do. You have to make it very, very specifically perform the one task. Um, yeah, and you have to validate your assumptions. Other takeaways that we had from that. <sighs> Users will def defer, default to illegal states. So um, you have to tell them that, that a state is illegal. We used like the red grippers to do that. Uh, we also used motion bound to do that. Uh, I saw some people do, do something like, ah, I don't wanna do this. And then a hand would be stuck over here because the robot couldn't solve moving the hand from here down back to where it should be. Um, the scale and the torque of the grippers and also the mass affect the user behavior. Um, so you really have to have visualization and feedback in place. Um, they never got it right the first time whenever we tried it. So you have to make tutorial levels like we did. Um, and the last thing, and super important that we didn't implement and I really want to implement is making the last action that you did easy to undo because you are performing an action on a robot that's affecting the environment. As far as you care, it's real. Okay, so last slide, I swear. Um, when, you, when you're building human-in-the-loop systems, here's what I want you to think about. Make the system modular. 
the more you can replace stuff in it, the quicker you can move. You have to state clear goals because any system that you're making that you're making that's human in the loop has people from different disciplines. If they know what you're trying to solve, they will work around what you can't solve. Okay, so always communicate well between people in the team. Avoid false empathy. I just covered that, but it's really important to remember. And remember that you're building a debugger, right? You have to expose parameters, you have to make agents interchangeable, and you have to make states rewindable. And remember that you're building a debugger and you're also building a game. So you have to exploit all the game's mechanic, game mechanics that you can. You have to move as fast as possible. Thank you. Questions? All right. Oh, question. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi. How do you come up with all of those uh, test scenarios? So basically, it's, it's a test scenario that you're pushing through um, the whole process, right? Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily think that I can call every single, uh, every single of these situations um, a full test scenario. I, we were trying to validate if a robot can uh, complete a certain task, right? So we're like, what is good for a human to perform that a robot can copy? Or um, what is a simple task in the case of dominoes? What is a simple task that we can play with, um, is simple for a human to understand, and um, uses the limitations of a gripper that the robot has. We, we pretty much, we brainstormed until we had something that works. There's no, there's no guidelines except for well, user creativity, I guess. I'm sorry if there was supposed to be a, a higher insight there. No, just use your creativity. <laughs> oh, hi, um, I just have a question. When you were uh, showing the tapping Isaacs and they were imitating the motion capture uh, files, um, you said uh, it's important to note that um, their score was ba not based on joints, but their overall performance. I'm just wondering how you uh, scored that. Yeah, so, so um, there, there are many variations on the, um, on the reward function, uh, but the end result is overall pose. So the, you, can, you can think about overall pose in many mm -hmm. ways. One result would be to project from the perspective of the camera and get like, you know, a least squares approximation. Another one would be to test the end effector positions, but not the actual joint hierarchy, because you might have you might have a small offset in the root joint, but still down along the hierarchy, there are some uh, corrections, right? If you were to judge joint by joint, um, you'd create an overfitting in the system that uh, is going to be hard to overcome in later steps. So. Um, there's a preference in some composite score that's undefined, I'm, I'm aware, um, but some composite score that, that would be more helpful for um, uh, letting the machine be more creative later on, I guess. That makes good sense. I've done the same thing in dance. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so I do a lot of simulation work as well, and one thing I find is with a sort of the old guard, if you want to call them that, the physical engineers, there's a little bit of skepticism and pushing back. I'm curious if you've had to deal with that and how you've dealt with that. Um, I think the proof is that we're getting results a lot quicker. Uh, so. Uh, I have no pretense when, especially when it's like uh, 20 or 30 year experience roboticists uh, to, to claim that I am um, in any way uh, improving their, uh, their techniques, like improving upon their techniques. I'm producing a new perspective that they couldn't do up until now because tech wasn't ready. Um, VR just lets you do that quicker and you know, like game engines, and simulation frameworks allow that allow you to move very fast, and they they never could. So, um, if you present it that way, it's a nice carrot, and suddenly your skills become complementary, and they uh, they they begin inquiring very quickly. Oh, and how do you do this? And can we also add some stickiness to it, and so on? So, I haven't found anyone who hates me for doing this so far. <laughs> um, yeah. I just had a quick point of clarification. In the Domino's example, uh -huh. you said there was 
eighty thousand games. There were eighty thousand games uh, uh, played in succession to train the reinforcement but, learning. But network. not all in VR. No, 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 no. Um, so we had we had a, a scripted agent uh, mm -hmm. make legal moves, um, and we had uh, a um, reward function mm -hmm. uh, reward um, legal moves from Isaac's side. Okay. Um, but the, the the scripted network was dumb, right? It, it, all it can do is play legal moves. When it couldn't, the simulation would just stop, right? Okay. So very early on, you'd get punished for making uh, silly things. Okay. But slowly, uh, you'd converge on first placing a domino next to another domino. <laughs> That's like the first thing. And then actually converging to make a legal move takes some time. I'm, I'm sorry, you got cut off. So it's a little bit... I guess unclear to me in that example, what the what was the VR adding that you couldn't have done with your sure, standard sure, sure. scripted methods? Yeah, so the scripted method only examines um, the scripted method only examines what is a legal move to make in front of the robot. But what you're actually trying to uh, teach the robot to do is to play a game of dominoes like humans would play them, right? So I could be placing the domino not exactly in the right place, uh, and I still want a legal move out of it. And I could be uh, placing the domino sideways, and the robot would then know how to do something like... Like, that was that was uh, one, like, interaction that we had. Just, like, say that you don't have a legal move. Um, the other thing that we're trying to do is not to make... It, to make the robot not make extreme motions outside their... their uh, their motion range. So all these things have to be trained in a network that breaks the in a scenario that breaks the rules. And so the last thing is then, so how many VR games were part of that training set for the <sighs> domino example? So you put the number of scripted yeah, yeah, games yeah, yeah, and yeah, I guess yeah. that's what I'm trying to tease out here. Um, altogether, probably low hundreds. Okay. Um, Maybe maybe like a hundred, a hundred and fifty. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>